Okay, here we go, part five. Let's make a mold of the gorilla sculpture I did. So I'm um, just kind of looking it over. <laughs> I'm laughing because, you know, you think you're done and then you look and you go, oh, I forgot that. <laughs> you know, so. I'm just noticing this little, little, little hyper my diaper here. There we go. Just wasn't clean enough for me. Now it is, more or less. Okay. All right. Okay, I'm gonna mold it. Okay, so, you know, I'm calling it. Let's mold it. Except for this one little speck. Oh, there's the other texture pad I've been looking for. I'm just pounding it a little bit more. Okay, so what I'm going to do is take the tripe of uh, the the uh, oh that's that's politically incorrect now, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to take the camera off the tripod and make you seasick and show you the things that I work with in order to make this mold. Well, to begin with, I'm going to be using UltraCal 30. Um, well, like I said, I'm going to take it off and we're going to do handheld. I'm sure glad I put that red pin on that fluid head tripod to keep this camera from going on the ground. Okay, so here we go. We're going to use our UltraCal 30. And I know you all want to know, a lot of you, I'm sure most of you have seen all this before, right? UltraCal 30. Now, if you go to Berman Industries or anyone that supplies these materials and buy them directly, this, is a, this was a 100-pound sack, I think, at one time. Uh, and, you know, it's like $44. And if you buy it off of uh, Amazon or something like that, it's like $200. Like 30 pounds they charge like $60 for, and that's ridiculous. I think a lot of that's in the shipping. Over here, ah, we got fiber. Well, burlap. I like to use burlap. What I do is I soak it in water first, because what happens if you don't, and you, you, you put the UltraCal in this, this stuff immediately starts absorbing the moisture off out of it, and it gets chunky and wants to set up faster. So, and you can get this from Amazon, no problem. Ship to your door very cheap and it works very well. Um, while I'm in the kitchen here though, I want to show you this mold. This is an old Planet of the Apes mold for a Cornelius appliance that was done here at the studio uh, with someone's help. Um, uh, Giselle. And this was 128.16? Wow. Oh, here. 128.16. Wow, that was a while ago. So, uh, but the mold's still in really good condition, and it's made very much the way they were made, although the, the, the uh, actual molds were square-shaped. But they had a back plate like this, and you can see the vent holes. This is exactly what they had on Planet of the Apes. Uh, my overflows are not as deep. These are more Dick Smith style. They're very shallow. They didn't need to be that thick. Uh, they, the, the ones on theirs were very, very deep, much deeper, like, like that deep. But, you know, they work well, and this works just as well. So what I want to try to do is, is to Vaseline up this and wax it first, a little Vaseline on both parts, and run it in polyurethane foam to see if we get a decent prosthetic out of it. And if I can and paint it, then we can actually, uh, we can actually sell you a reusable foam prosthetic that simulates what they had in Planet of the Apes. So let's make a mold in this. First thing I'm going to do is get a bucket, put some water in it. Okay, so here we have uh, uh, a nice bucket with water in it, and that is our burlap, which has been soaking now for a while. And then we have some water here, which uh, you can see, I don't have a lot. In fact, it might be a bit much. I'm going to do a splash coat first. So a little bit of water goes a long way with UltraCal. 
with any gypsum, it does. So what I'm going to do is scoop some of this in, and I think you can see into there pretty well. And of course, the minute I start to do this, what happens? The tree killers, that's what I call them. Somebody had a bunch of trees in front of their building, and I guess they had a, an allergy to trees because they cut them all down, and there was nothing wrong with the trees. So it's a little, ex, little less oxygen for us all. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, scoop this in here. And the water is room temperature. If you want it to go off slower, and it's cold, uh, okay, that's going to... Uh, where's my disposable brush? Yes, disposable brush to put on the splash coat with. I also spritz water usually onto the surface of what I'm about to mold. This is so messy. There's never, never a way that I've ever seen. I mean, I hate the people who are neat and clean with this stuff. Don't you? <laughs> now, you see I've got a little sort of a peninsula going there. So I'm going to stick my hand in there. Yeah, that's right. Just put my hand in there. I'm going to start mixing. And there's a certain consistency I want. Uh, and that's almost it. This might be a little on the thick side. Nice to see that this UltraCal is still good. There's only a few boulders in it. But that's a good amount for a splash coat, and I might want it to be just a little bit more water in it. So luckily I happen to have a little bit right here. Just a little bit. That's like perfect. As John Chambers used to say to me, you don't want piss water. <laughs> That's what the term was, piss water. See, see how that flows? You want it to flow like that, but you don't want it to be too, too thin either, because if it's too thin, then it has less strength. At least so they say. So we're gonna dip this brush. You always get your brush wet first. That helps a lot. And I did uh, put some mold release uh, on uh, the sculpture. I have to remove this glove in order to move the camera. We do not want to get this stuff on the camera. So, which inevitably it will try to do. As I move the camera, put it over here. We're going to zoom in. Zoom in. Thank you. Uh, zoom back out a little bit. So you can see I put clay uh, at the base down here. And uh, this is just so, I mean, you don't need to have UltraCal to UltraCal contact anywhere but where it rests against the mouth and side, which has also been mold released, and the eyes, which have been mold released. And then I put some mold release out here too, which uh, I'm going to try this stuff too. Zip. Ooh. There it goes. I didn't want it to do that. It did not want it to do that. And uh, this is more of a sort of a Vaseline based stuff. It's called Zip. And it, I, a gentleman on uh, YouTube said that he used uh, Lemon Pledge, I believe, or something like that. Lemon Pledge, yes. So I better move my butt because I got to put another set of gloves on um, and start putting this on. Gloves. Gloves. I don't know where my spritz bottle is with water in it, but I think we'll live without it. It was here. I know. I can't find my spritz bottle. Okay. Somebody actually put up, I can't find my popsicle stick. Ah, there it is. Ha <laughs> ha. So the mold release is kind of dry, but what I want to do is just put a light coat on like that. Now I can touch the camera. And I'm going to take this UltraCal and start getting it on there. You see how that brush, that, that splash of um, water helps the stuff flow. Uh, much to my alarm, I am seeing some granulation in this UltraCal, so I sure hope we're OK. Otherwise, we'll be sculpting this all over again. <laughs> But I ran a test. 
I ran a test. I did, I did, I did. Now you see, you know darn well you're getting in there. And that water, that bit of spritz that I put in there, spritz, spritz, also helps. Because, you know, you're always going to get these darn bubbles if you don't. So now I'll try to get in between the mouth, and that's usually where most of it's going to be a pain in the butt. Now with UltraCal 30 as opposed to plaster, I would be panicking right now if this was plaster. Many times have I made molds, so many molds in my career, I mean, I can't count them. I guarantee you, I got in that mouth. I got in, and I'm going to get all this over here. Then we're going to go for the ears. I can still see bubble trying to, look, look at that, burp. Burp. Now I'm not seeing granulation in the older cow, which is a good sign. Now there, there's the ears. You really want to get in there. Now you see how the material is just sort of flowing? It's flowing. And that's what you want. You don't want it to just sit there because then you're going to be getting bubbles in everything. You could also take compressed air after you do your splash coat and go psh, psh, psh. They like those sound effects? It really disturbs me that I'm seeing this granulation because that usually means that uh, the UltraCal has been compromised by moisture. We were right by the ocean here, and so ever since uh, I went from living in the valley to living by the ocean, thankfully, that uh, things are damper. There's more uh, moisture, and it, you know, it takes bags of plaster if they're not sealed up right, and even if they are, and turns them into unusable material very quickly. So I find that I get only what I need and use it up. Now I tested this UltraCal and it was fine, so I gotta stop worrying. So this is our splash coat. And I never touch the actual uh, sculpture. I just use the brush and build it up. That also helps. It's the shock will pop bubbles. So now we're getting there quick. Now, if you get bubbles in your mold, and if you're new to this, you get bubbles. It's no big deal, not unless they're huge. But even then, learn to sculpt backwards. I've done it plenty. You. Uh, clay press with some water-based clay in your mold. You see well, what the damage is as a result of the bubble and you sculpt back in very slowly with very thin down ultra cowl uh, in a cup and a brush, small brush, and you patch the bubble. Check, patch the bubble, check. And I know guys that were so good at that, you could not tell that maybe a huge area was missing because they just put it back in. You got to know how to sculpt backwards, that's all. You have good reference by looking inside the mold. You can look all around and see what things look like when they're in reverse. So now it's starting to thicken up a little bit, but you see it's still flowing pretty good. So it looks like I'm going to have enough to do a solid ultra cal mold and I will not have to do um, a plaster backing on it, which I have done. I don't want it to be real heavy either. You don't need it to be super thick. That's an old wise tale. Thick is not necessarily, well, thick is stronger, yeah, but if you got fiber in it, you're good. Now, at some point in time here, I'm going to use a spatula to uh, get this stuff just right. You know, when you're doing a mold like this, as many times as you've done it, and now that I'm older, I think to myself, did I forget something? Yeah, I did. There's no teeth in this thing. But if you thought the teeth were part of the mass, think again. Because 
<laughs> it's really hard to get those teeth in there and then you know expect to actually have them. Oh, look, a bug. A speck. Yeah, we have these little bugs because they're right by the strawberry field. So, uh, uh, so the teeth are were in the movie were were done, the prosthetics anyway were done separately and added. They're made out of solid slip, and that's what I've been doing for these masks. And so I'll be after I have the mask, I will sculpt some teeth. Or maybe the teeth I have for the chimps will work. They might. We'll find out. I think they did cross-pollinate the teeth a lot of times. You have to understand that, you know, they had like 150 makeup artists working on Planet of the Apes. And not all of them, you know, took it, you know, looked at it the way you and I do, being Planet of the Apes fans, like, you know, the sacredness of it all. And, you know, you can't put chimpanzee teeth and... Uh, gorilla mouths and so on and so forth. It's like Spock's ears, you know. When I was asked by Fred Phillips to sculpt Spock's ears, it was the first day I was down at Paramount in the old, uh, on the stage, I forget the name of the stage, in the old makeup room used for the original TV show. And Fred came in and he said, Steve, and he handed me a pair of Leonard Nimoy's ears, which were sculpted by Wa Chang, refined by John Chambers, and molded probably by Werner Kepler. I'm not sure. It might have been John. And they were in perfect condition because, you know, that was 1978 and it hadn't been that long. The foam was still in good condition. And he said, Can you replicate these? And I say, again, exactly. And I said, well, God, Fred, I was so excited because, you know, Spock was my favorite character. I was just new to Hollywood, and here I am getting to uh, do Spock's ears, which was like a dream, a dream come true. It was just a fantastic thing, and, and Fred knew it was important to me. He, yeah, you know, kids, you like that stuff, so. <laughs> um, it was probably the reason he hired me, because he knew I took it so seriously. So I made the ears exactly to what watch hang and chambers had done and then about i don't know halfway through the shoot the molds were breaking down but they had masters and they could keep making new ones off the master molds well they brought another makeup artist in and i'm not going to say who it was and he decided that my ears were no good and uh, he wanted to do his he wanted to redo them and then the fat stubby short ears were born that many of you realized and noticed if I know from all the emails I got about, about uh, when you found out that I did the ears that, you know, here it is the beginning of the movie, he walks in on the bridge and his ears are exactly the same as they were in the original TV show the last time you saw that character. And then, halfway through the film, you'll notice they get short and stubby. And then at one point, because they would take and run all the ear molds, at one point, Leonard is wearing one size ear on one side of his head and another side, another size on the other. Two different ones. I'm going to go clean this brush out. I just don't believe in wasting things. This brush will be used again. So I, I try to save things like that. Okay, so I need my spatula. A spatula! Where's my spatulas? And, of course, they're nowhere to be seen because I need them. <laughs> well, <laughs> I do have big popsicle sticks. This just figures. Oh, this is a whole area full of sculpting materials. And you think I can find a spatula? Heck no. Maybe they're down here next to the old algae that I probably should throw out. Nope. All right. Okay. And, of course, the big popsicle sticks are missing, too. So, hmm, ha, huh. walla walla bing bang. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Well, I guess I'll just use something like this. I prefer the rubber spatulas because they are uh, less aggressive against clay sculptures. What I'm trying to do here 
is smooth out thing. You see how it's, it's, it's not moving much anymore? If you start moving it with your hands and you're not delicate, it'll all start to slide downhill. And you don't want that. But I want to get it fairly smooth because we're going to do another batch, of course. And we're going to make, that's going to be a fiber coat. Rosie, you can step over that, honey. You're fine. She's, she's observing that there's a cord going across that the uh, light over here is hooked up to. Now I'm going to use my hands right here because I kind of have to. Rosie, go on, go on, go on. You're good. You're good. Go on. There you go. No, step over it, Rosie. Rosie, go on. There you go. There you go. Rosie the Wonder Dog, 11 years later, and still the Wonder Dog. And I turn 70 uh, in, in first first week of March. Can't believe it. Freaking 70 years old. You know, I still feel the same. This stuff's so cool to do, I want to do more. You know, I just... What happened to so many of you out there? I remember when we all were doing this stuff, how there was great talk about how we would do this stuff until we dropped. That we'd never, ever stop being uh, the rock stars of makeup effects. I remember that term uh, in Hollywood because we were the, the 80s people. And I still have my 80s car right over there, my 300ZX in perfect condition, just like it was then in the day, because I put money into it and kept it, <laughs> kept it in good shape. But, you know, what happened? I mean, I mean, I know a lot of, a lot of people went west and we lost them. And that's a good reason not to be doing this stuff anymore. You're no longer here, but there's plenty of people that I had talked to and they said, well, I'm just bored with it. I've done it all. And, you know, um, V. Neal is not one of those people. But there are others out there. And they won Academy Awards and everything. And they just feel that, you know, there's nothing more. So what there is, you can still do this stuff. It's still just as fun to be a kid and make monsters as it ever was. It doesn't matter about age. And there's no such thing as growing up. Because you know what happens when you grow up? and act your age, you get old and die. So, I mean, you really get old, not just physically old. Okay, so we need another bucket because we're gonna pour, make up some more. Oh, geez. Do I have a bucket that's clean and ready to go? No, that's not being prepared. Ah, uh, let's see. I'm going to use a tool and turn this off. So now we're going to do the fiber coat, and I'm going to widen up for that so you can see what I do here. I don't think you can see down in the bucket, but I'm going to mix up some more. And that's the same thing. I'm just going to pour it in there and I get my little peninsula. Oh man, there's a peninsula. Oh, it's an island. You a peninsula. I don't know. One of those. It's Friday, and I'm happy. I just ordered my... Uh, well, it's a milestone. I'm turning 70. 20 was a milestone. Uh, 30 was a milestone. 40 was a milestone. 50 was like, wow, that's a milestone. And uh, 60 was like, oh boy, that's really a milestone. But when you get to be 70, yeah, that's a milestone. <laughs> and so I always get myself something nice for my birthday. And I've taken an interest, uh, well, you know I'm a radio-controlled model nut. Uh, not just radio control, free flight modeling too, and auto racing modeling, and slot cars, and uh, RC uh, cars. Uh, but I love gliders. There's just something about 
gliders, the type that don't have motors, the type that you fly on the wind, thermal slope. They're beautiful, they're elegant, they're silent. Talk about something that has no carbon footprint whatsoever uh, other than the ba onboard battery. I, I imagine it takes some carbon somewhere to make those batteries, but that's it. It's electric, it's quiet, it's silent, it's not disturbing, and they're beautiful. Big two meter wings, all transparent, beautiful colors. So you just, they're wonderful. So I bought myself, not that I don't have one already, what's called a, a Rez glider, which I'm gonna try to move the camera down here so you can see what I'm doing somewhat. Can, can we do that? Well, not really, only if I move it down, I just got plaster on the tripod, just figures. Uh, well, you kind of can, so what I'm gonna do, oh, uh, Rez, I was gonna tell you, yes, Rez, Rez, what does Rez stand for? It stands for rudder, elevator, and <laughs> rudder, elevator, and spoiler, which is what slows you down. You see what I'm doing? I'm taking this stuff that's soaked, and I'm getting most of the water out of it, and I'm putting it in to the ultra cowl like so, and then I'll have to take the gloves off to move the camera and getting that stuff really welked in, worked into the weave, and then I'm gonna come up here while this is still green. I mean, it's not moving anymore, but it's still green. It binds better when it's green, and I'm gonna put it on. Now, I'm gonna have to uh, take these gloves off in order to move the camera, because I don't think you can see what I'm doing, not well anyway. You don't need a lot of this. Off come the gloves. There's a joke in there somewhere. Okay, off come the gloves, and uh, we're gonna move the camera. God darn it. Okay. 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 Gloves. Ouch. Walmart's good for something. They have disposable gloves. <laughs> Examination gloves. Usually I order them online, but Walmart's right around the corner and they're quite inexpensive, so. So that's, uh, you notice that the UltraCal was a bit thicker than I'd use the splash coat because when the water, the, these, this is pretty well soaked in with water, so that'll make it kind of thin, and it, it, they'll thin it out somewhat, and so it helps that it's uh, a thicker batch than for a splash coat. Sorry, I get thinking and then I stop talking. So anyway, I was going back to the glider, because you know this routine now. Hope you're not too confused. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the glider is rudder, elevator, and spoiler. And the spoiler is this, this for those of you who don't know uh, model or aviation in general, it's a thing that pops up like a flap and slows down the glider when you're coming for an in for a landing so you don't overshoot because you can't go around. Uh, just like full-size gliders, you, you want to land on a dime as much as possible because you won't have the energy to circle, go back around the field, and try for a better landing. So if you're coming in too hot, you put the spoilers on nice and easy, you watch your airspeed, and you slow down, and you do a nice flare, and you touch down. Without them, it's difficult to do. It can be done, but it's not recommended. Uh, so it has the spoilers for that reason. Because even on a model, you need them. So that's where the res comes from. I didn't know what, what they meant by it. it. I kept thinking, what was what res? What is a res glider? And two meter, of course, is 78 inches to 79 inches uh, wingspan on the gliders. So they're, they're a nice size, not terribly big. And, um, they're, I don't know, the older I get, 
the less comfortable I, fly, I feel flying something uh, with a carbon fiber sharp as hell prop turning a lot of RPMs that can inflict a lot of damage on someone should they get out of control like yourself. If I've had it happen. I've been almost lost a finger once. Um, so with peaceful flying, and I won't say they're slow either because you can get them going very fast, but the gliders uh, hold the record, speed record for, for uh, RC. You'd think it'd be jets and propellered airplanes, but no. I think we got enough fiber on this. I really do. Okay, to see how it's sticking up from it. And I'm just going to take the remaining uh, material that's in here and do that. Kind of smooth it out a little bit. And I may put one more coat on this, but I don't know. It looks like it's pretty well thick enough to me. Maybe just a little bit more, just a little bit more for my security blanket. And I can do it right now in the same bucket before this stuff sets up. And now, because the bottom coat, uh, the, the splash coat is set up pretty much, I can go to town on this and um, Uh, use the spatula and not worry about damaging the sculpture because I can't go through the first layer at this point. So, okay, we're going to do that other little small batch. And I don't need a lot, just a little bit. So we had plenty of ultra cows that turned out to do this mold. And I think I used less than 20 pounds to make this mold. Now, of course, this has to be taken off, and I don't think we'll do that today. We will remove this uh, from the sculpture on Monday. Let's let it sit over the weekend and really crystallize and really get set up well. I mean, we could do it today after it cools off because it heats up this material. In fact, all materials like this go through what's called an exothermic process where it creates its own heat, heats up, sets off the material, and then it hardens up. I mean, whether it be polyurethane foam or epoxy, they all kind of do it that way. If you want all the grisly details, just look up exothermic on Google. Or just ask, ask the Siri. Or what's the other one? Alexa. We have both. It's nine o'clock. Enjoy your evening. To me, it's creepy. Only because I grew up on science fiction that warned me about such things. You ever see the movie uh, Demon Seed? <laughs> Those of you in the know who have seen the movie Demon Seed can probably see what I'm talking about. And if we're not careful, what could happen? Uh, there's another one, too. Especially the remake of Battlestar Galactica, one of the best science fiction television programs I've ever seen. And one that, and I quote, Doug Drexler told me, is better than Star Trek. Yeah, Doug Drexler actually said, oh, Steve, you've never seen it? And I said, well, I felt bad because, you know, he was doing the effects on it. And I said, no, I, you know, I didn't like the first one. And it was sort of silly. Said, oh, no, you got to see it. You got to. It's better than Star Trek. I went, wait, wait, took his temperature. <laughs> Well, it's like comparing apples and oranges. To be honest and be fair, Star Trek is wonderful, and I would never put down Star Trek. But it was, uh, Battle Star Galactica was James Edward Almost. God, I love that guy. Um, and Mary McDonald, crazy about her, too. She's just, wow. What a wow girl, lady, person she is. And the whole series is amazing. 
and it was kind of amazing watching it because when I was watching it, Jilly was fighting her cancer, just like the Madam President. And uh, yeah, well, at least she got to see the whole series. She loved it. I remember at one point telling her, "Honey, you don't have to watch this," because I didn't know about uh, you know the Madam President getting pan cancer and all that. And no, she she was brave. My my late wife, Jilly, and she. She watched that show. She loved it. She watched it through to the end. Yeah. So anyway, I'm jumping all over the place because my, my brain at this point in my life does that because I've experienced so much. <laughs> I've done so much. I've learned so much. And I'm still learning, like about the, uh, the, uh, the pledge being sprayed on sculptures and they come out of the molds better. You know, that I've got to try. I mean, this stuff will probably do the same thing, but <laughs> either that or it's destroyed the surface and I have to do this all over again. <laughs> but, you know, I'm always learning. None of us are experts. And as a great modeler and, and thinker once said, and still says, because he's still with us, David Merriman. We stand on the shoulders of giants. Well, that's certainly true. I stand on the shoulders of Dick Smith, John Chambers, uh, William Tuttle, uh, the Westmores, wonderful people, uh, the Bermans. It's so many great makeup artists and people. And um, I, I would be not doing this stuff or knowing what I'm doing, as I think I do, <laughs> if it wasn't for those giants. They're giants. John Chambers was a giant. Okay, crazy Irishman, but I love them. So now, okay, I'm gonna take the gloves off again, kind of get all the stuff off of me. And I see I'm bleeding again. Yeah, I got caught by a door the other day. And when you're this age, your skin gets very thin and everything uh, bruises you and cuts you. And I gotta start wearing gloves like all the time when I'm working from now on or I'm gonna regret it. So if you have rubber spatulas, and this is something I learned from Rob Berman. <laughs> After all these years I've been doing this stuff, and he saw me laying up this stuff by hand, smoothing it by hand, and he said, I just use a spatula. <laughs> and I just sort of looked at him, and I felt like such a dummy. <laughs> and I've been using them ever since. It especially works good when you're doing a life mask, and you don't want your hands in the alginate, which is really annoying. I would use gloves and then shut them off afterwards, but, but you know, he's a, he's a spatula and he's, you know, he's helping me make a life mask and it's like, it's like, God, that's just so smart. But then again, Mr. Berman, Mr. Rob Berman, he's a very smart guy and a very, very good person who I admire. So. And I wish he had gotten more credit for the things he did. Like, we couldn't have done Ghostbusters without that guy. And he was just in the lab running foam. He wasn't uh, sculpting. He should have been. None of us knew he was such a good artist. You know, we could have asked, I guess. The people in charge could have asked. Um, but he just did his job, and he did it well. And, Man, he ran all those big foam rubber pieces. I remember, you know, I sculpted a lot on the, with Linda and Mike on the big terror dog sculpture because I was done working on my part of the show and they said, well, how about you go in there and help those guys finish sculpting that giant terror dog sculpture. And uh, I remember him running the foam with these giant foam injectors and these big molds and pieces and, and running these giant pieces, not to mention the Marshmallow Man, those were big. I did the underskulls for that and some of the mechanics. Um, yeah, and he just, he could just do it, man. He's very confident running that rubber. I think Dale Brady was working with him in there too, another really talented guy. These people all showed up in time and worked really hard. That's why the effects in Ghostbusters was so good. 
I, was, I, I gotta tell you, at the time when I was working on it, I was really disappointed because they were doing 2010, and being that 2001 is my favorite movie of all time, I, uh, I wanted to work on it, and they wouldn't let me. They were gonna have me do The Star Child, and they told me, you can do The Star Child. And I was done with my bits on Ghostbusters, and then they came up with something else, and they put my kosh on it. Uh, and, you know, they said how sorry they were. But I got to watch the Discovery being built oh, again, and the Leonov and all that. And as it turned out, the film, yeah, the film was okay. I mean, it wasn't really a proper sequel to 2001. It was a different movie altogether. But I like space films. I like space films that try to be something that I might experience in my lifetime such as 2001, and, you know, bits of Star Trek, which all came true. You know, everything from iPads to flip phones, which we had for a while. Oh. It all starts with imagination. Every single thing that you have, from the clothes on your back to the buildings that you occupy, the bed you sleep in, uh, all started with imagination first, not science. The creators, the imaginative people, came up with the ideas and the scientists went, how can we do that? Well, they wouldn't have thought about it in general if it hadn't been for the, the people who imagined the stuff, like Jules Verne, from Earth to the Moon. Three astronauts leave from Florida and go to the moon. I mean, it's just, you know, the Nautilus, Jules Verne, and so on and so forth. Now, you can see this stuff's getting really thick. And they, these work quite well. I mean, this is for, uh, this is Bondo. It's for putting Bondo on cars, bodies and stuff. But it works pretty well. You can see some of the fiber sticking through, and that's really not an issue. I could have had more on there, but this will be fine. This is going to be a good mold. Now, if I want, I can make this mold look absolutely perfectly smooth if I wait, um, and then start smoothing it down by hand when it gets to a certain point. Like right now, almost. So, and you get a pretty smooth mold. But you don't need it. It's just for looks. But you can see that this is setting up really well. And uh, all the timing on it's been very good. So I know actually this Ultra Cal is OK. It has a little bit of moisture damaged to it, but very little. So um, once this fully sets up, I think the surface will be fine inside. And the way I did it, there shouldn't be any bubbles. But you know, I save that to till the end when we open the mold. I wish it could be today, but it can't. I would normally open it tomorrow, but I'm not here on weekends. At least not very often. Sometimes I pop in. You never know when I might be here, but in general, we don't do that. So if it sits all the way to Monday, it's going to be really good to pull off. So. I think that's it. I mean, you know, I'm going to mark on it. I mean, this all get chipped off, all this stuff around here and when it comes off. And we take a, a surface tool to it and grind that stuff all off and, and uh, clean the mold out, which the clay should release quite well, especially if it sits till um, Monday, because it'll be, from the cold back here, the it, temperature of the clay will be very low. and It'll be very stiff, and it'll just pop out of the mold. But really. This is a very simple mold. It's probably the first kind of mold I ever made in my life when I started all this stuff. I made a mold of a, an ape sculpture just like this and poured latex inside of it and then glued it to my face. Uh, just, out of, just out of regular you know, slip cast rubber, which I think I also got from Paramount Theatrical Supply back in those days. And they still exist. And I can feel now it's getting warm. And I will turn this off for now, and I will come back and you will be able to see the heat come off it. All right, you should be able to see, coming off of this, some uh, 
some steam rising. I think. I'm not seeing it on the monitor, but I know it's getting in there. Let me get closer. Yes, I believe we're seeing it. And so this is getting pretty hard. Amazing, huh? Okay, so we're going to do P of the apes go. Please don't let me spell this wrong. <laughs> Really? And we do uh, 2022. My God, 2022. This all started for me in 1968. Oh, my God. Anyway, and then I'll just kind of put my name on it like this. In case anybody ever ends up with these years from now, which they may do. You know how collectors are. God, I wonder what this would go for on eBay. 30 years from now. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so uh, that tells me what it is because they have a lot of molds. And, um, but now we have the, well, now you can really see that, that steam coming off it and my wonder dog in the background. So um, um, so that's it. You got to see the mold made. We'll open it up on Monday and see how it looks inside. I'm sure it'll be fine. And then we can actually make a mask before we move on to the orangutan. Yep, we're going to do that next and the prosthetics. So have a great weekend and I will see you on Monday. And thanks again for the buy me a coffee. Some of you have been sending in and all the support and all the likes and keep hitting that like button because it really helps me. It doesn't do me much good on Facebook, but it does wonders on YouTube to tell YouTube you're watching and you are watching and we love you a whole bunch and we'll see you next week on Monday. Okay, after con careful consideration and thinking about this whole letting it sit over the weekend thing, I thought it might be harder to open if I did that because it's warm and the clay's kind of soft and things are sweating inside and it should be easier to open. I should be able to just open it by hand, I'm hoping. I just pull hard enough, but I have to watch myself because years ago I had a very bad hernia and then I had uh, it repaired and I, you know, just need to be careful. I see it moving. Definitely moving, but you want to do a little bit from each side so you lift out straight. And it, if I had been smart, which I was not, I would have put in a way to pry this open, but I didn't. But also I thought that it might be just this easy. So there, most of the clay came out very cleanly. Let's see what we got inside. I see that we did get some chipping under the eyes, which is uh, not a problem to fix. It's because of the angle that it came out from, and I have the chips right here, but they're not on the mask. <laughs> they're on the eye part, so we're okay. This looks very good. I'll, I'll, I'll get the camera to move here in a minute so you can see inside, but this looks, yeah, this is fine. This is a very good mold. <sighs> you know, no matter how many times you do this stuff, you, uh, you find yourself gasping. So uh, it's hard for you to see in here, so I'm going to move the camera closer. And now you should be able to see in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to dig out a lot of this clay while it's soft. Because when it's a solid piece like that, it's harder to collapse it away from the sides 
and get it to release. So I'm just kind of getting down in here and, and digging out a cavity with a wooden tool. Oh, great. Now they're playing drums next door. You know, this is not an apartment dwelling, people. This is a, a business area shop thing. Now, you'll see, now that I got this to be thinned out, I can kind of go shaky, 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 wiggle, 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 and you get big chunks to come out. See, I got the whole lower jaw to come out. And you can see it's all clean and nice. I got all of this very well. So now we're going to dig out this. Same thing. And all this clay is reusable. I didn't know that they were setting up musical instruments next door. This is going to be great when we start shooting the next movie and we have to do some shooting in here. Yeah, as you can see, there's a big old chunk down in there. We're going to try to get out of there cleanly. But if I make it thin, you see the clay is still very soft. I didn't think we'd open this today. I'm kind of glad we are, because you know what? I won't be wondering all weekend. Gee, I wonder how it came out. If it didn't come out good, there's only one thing you can do. You saw how it came out of the mold. You saw what happened to the sculpture. You have to re-sculpt the whole thing. Now, in the future, when the mold starts to wear out, I can clay press this mold, or make another casting up, and correct the rubber and make a new mold, like a master mold. And you can see this is just... So what the guy was telling me about using the mold release, uh, which in his case was, uh, oh man, was uh, lemon pledge, I think. Or pledge for wood is one of those. He is absolutely right, because Usually, when you don't use things like that, what you end up doing is scraping the clay out and taking alcohol to it to get it all out, all the little clay out of the mold. And as you can clearly see, I didn't have to do that once. So thank you. Uh, I wish I could name you. You see, there's a bubble there. I'll just patch that. But that's just where the hair is going to be anyway. But I still need to patch it. But you can see that this came out just perfect. It really is perfect. So, and that stuff there can go bye-bye. It's nice. Very nice. Really nice. I am just pleased as punch with that. Really nice mold. Got a little bit of chipping right there. I've got the pieces, and I will deal with that on Monday. I'll show you how you can put stuff back or just patch it. Now, getting the ears out, of course... This is going to be a little more problematic because there's an undercut in there. But I do know that the mold release really worked well. So I'll just do the same thing, dig out a channel so I can collapse the clay away from the wall. or not. I'm using a metal tool now, but I'm being very careful. He says knowingly. There it goes. There we go. There we go. You just got to get like an edge of it. And then if you wiggle it, has a tendency to come out clean. And 
You know, this is really stuck up in there, unfortunately. There goes a big chunk. But none of the clay is actually sticking well to the, the ultra cowl. It just doesn't want to. It just wants to come away from it. So once I get that, my head, my big fat head blocking, let me know in the comments. See, this is real tight right here. And so the only way I'm gonna get that out is to uh, get some kind of tool in there that's narrow and kind of force it out. Another big chunk. See, the mold release that he suggested really works. And then, then there's no surface on this, so uh, material, plastic cap, or anything like that. So we're not going to have any problem with the clay thickening up. I mean, the rubber thickening up against the ultra cal. So this is a little hard to get this one out but it's all there. So, anyway, uh, a little PS to this video. The mold came out perfect. We will trim off all of this and it'll dry out pretty well over the weekend, at least well enough to make, uh, be able to pour some rubber in here. Again, thanks everyone for watching. Thank you for the likes. I just thank you. You people are wonderful. We'll see you on Monday.